Russia, Russia, ra da da da. It's a time to consider Russia. Yeah. Today we are talking about the Kirov class cruisers, and yes, there is a part one that's sitting there visibly, which means there's going to be a part two at some point. And considering there have been two Kirov class cruisers, there is a quite a big option in what I could be talking about. Could I be talking about the Project 114 vessels? The huge vessels which played a key role in recommissioning of the Iowa class. When I say key role, basically it turned it into a who has the bigger non-carrier in service. And the US thought, well, we can either build them or we can just go mahusive. And so they went mahusive and went, we have Iowas in service. Deal with it. Yeah. Or the 180mm armed Project 26 vessels of 1936-ish. That probably led to many, many weird issues within the Kriegsmarine, uh, thanks to the joyous people of the National Socialist or Nazis and their particular regime. Now, Which do you think I'm talking about today? It's the 180mm ones. Yes, I like the Project 26, and I'm going in historical order. So that means the Project 11. Oh, Ooh, good lord. Brain di uh, died there. <laughs> the Project 1144. I knew it wasn't 1140. Will be on Friday. Now, these ships are special to me. They are the first cruisers that the Soviet Union builds. They are the closest to what cruiser should fit on roughly 10,000 tons. And what do I mean by this? The Soviet Union is technically not bound by any treaties, but they a source quite a lot of the technological know-how from nations which are because the soviet union and the revolution in russia has destroyed quite a lot of their industry which means it's very very difficult for them to build anything and they are trying to build capital ships and cruisers and destroyers basically a whole fleet yesterday because comrade stalin that wonderful dictator of the Soviet Union at this point, has decided that's what he'd particularly like. For those who couldn't guess there, sarcasm. Anyway, they went to the font of all knowledge in naval construction that is known as Italy. Which is not a bad idea, because let's be honest, Italy does design some gorgeous looking ships. And they had traditionally had a close relationship with Russia in terms of ship design. Mm, small issues around about turbine construction design and the actually heavy machinery plant engineering to one side. Mm, the Russians are offered the Raymond Monteculi class as details, and they're also off the Duke de Acosta class. Now, the design goes through several permutations. They even look at six-inch models, which fits with what the Italians themselves fitted this sort of design with. They decided they didn't like that. They did look at eight-inch guns, but they didn't have anything in the 200 millimeter really in construction at this point that was viable. Thank the Lord love a duck. As if they decided to wait for it, they would probably made them delay even more. But they do have 180mm weapons available. Now, why is 180mm interesting? Well, if you remember correctly, the Washington Treaty sets limit at 8 inches. 200mm roughly. The 
joyous thing that is the London Naval Treaty of 1930 introduces the 6-inch light cruiser. Anything which has guns larger than 6-inch, but small than 8-inch, are now a heavy cruiser. Well, these vessels have 7-inch guns. They don't quite have paper mache armor, but it's probably not something you want to be in a heavy duty fight in. Especially as it's homemade. And metallurgy was another area which the Soviet Union suffered in because of the effects of the Civil War. Industry is a very temperamental beast at best of times. Research and development is even worse. They often require long periods of stability, peace, and money. You interrupt any one of those three things, you get a trouble. You interrupt all three, you get a full-blown deg degradation. So, they take the designs of the power plants and the various other systems. The Italians promised them that if they keep it under 7,200 tons, they will manage to achieve 37 knots. Why that's particularly attractive to the Russians, I'm not so sure. Okay, I can see certain advantages in the Baltic for being high speed, and the Black Sea, which are both confined spaces. But if I'm operating in a confined space, as I've said before, my options are to go small and expendable, but in large numbers, or large but supreme. In which case, I'm probably going to exchange speed for life. However, if I am putting together ships which are going to serve in my Northern Fleet, my Baltic Fleet, my Black Sea Fleet, and my Pacific Fleet, if I'm going to put ships together for all four of those scenarios, I have a small problem. Because the ships that fit best for providing me operations in the Baltic and the Black Sea are probably not going to provide me the range of options I need to A, move out of those into the North Sea and the Mediterranean, let alone into the Atlantic or the Indian Ocean. But more importantly, are going to be issues for me when I'm talking about the Atlantic, straight and, well, the North, uh, <laughs> the, the lovely Arctic quarters, then the Atlantic, and the Pacific. These are issues. These are issues which I'm going to have to somehow juggle. Now, again, the Soviet Union was blessed with actually having some pretty good naval architects. They were lucky. They did have some good ones. And this will show as time develops on and as the Soviets build ships. As they do get better with the industry and the metallurgy, the designs do become more and more interesting. Yes, we can talk about their tech, how much it was less at a disadvantage or advantage vis-a-vis -vis Western. The one thing you tend to realize about Soviet technology is it tends to be very rugged. Basically, everything is built like a tractor to withstand being bashed and biffed and maintained by people who have variable skill sets. That's one thing about the Soviet Union. They were always quite understanding of what the reality was of the quality of the training they were giving their maintainers. So these ships start off as a twin six inch, four twin six inch turret design basically from the Italians. They evolve into a three twin 7.1 inch, that's 180 millimeter from 155 millimeter to 180 millimeter. And from there they evolve because the architect who's going, we can do this, we can do this. I, it's more than I think we can do this. We can actually do this into a free triple 180mm turret design.
by an out of iron brew. The world is problematic. Anyway, so 113,500 shaft horsepower. We have six Yarrow Normand water tube boilers. Really? You go for the French built Yarrow. Okay. 191.3 meters long, 17.66 meters in beam, 6.15 meters in draft, in fully loaded. 9,436 tons fully loaded, but 7,890 tons in standard. So they're 690 tons more than the promised speed. 690 tons more than the promised speed for getting 37 knots. Uh, displacement for getting 37 knots. And they get 36 knots. That ain't bad. You've added on near enough 700 tons and you have st only dropped a knot. That's... that's luck. That's also, to an extent, less than believable, but leave it on one side. It, it worked. Now, the ships are built in pairs, and each pair is an evolution of the last pair, okay? This is where one of those phrases comes in. Now, it isn't a translation in terms of wording. It is not something which I would want you to quote as a translation. But, if you ever see something like Project 26, that's the first generation of those ships. If you see Project 26 Abyss, that's usually the second generation or second batch. Bis two, third batch, third generation. I know that's not a translation, but unless you're a Russian speaker, it doesn't really matter. You know, you can get the rough intention of it. Okay. They are also armed with six single hundred millimeter guns, six single forty five millimeter guns. Because why go for forty millimeter? Why? Why go for what everyone else is doing? Four single 12.7 millimeters machine guns, two triple uh, 533 millimeters, that's 21 inch torpedo tubes, between 96 and 164 mines, and 50 depth charges. Now, this is where you realize that you are dealing with an Italian or origination ship. 50 millimeter belt on the waterline, 50 millimeter belt on the de deck. 50 millimeters belt on the turrets, and 50 millimeters on the barbettes. But don't worry, conning tower, so where we have presumably the political officer and the very expensive people to train, they're 150 millimeters of armor. And you've got a Heinkel catapult supporting two Core 1 seaplanes. So you have what is, in effect, an international naval hot rod. Built in Russia, from an Italian design, with Anglo-French boilers, Russian guns, and to an extent, Italian philosophy, especially when it comes to armour, and German aviation facilities. If it all works, it works. Now, the Kirov, she's an interesting ship. She is laid down in Os Dordizonsky's yard, Leningrad, which I won't be talking about in this video, but it will be in part two because it's the yard which also builds all of the later Kirov class. So it's a major part of that story. It builds two of the six in this story, in this history. So I moved it because otherwise I was going to repeat myself in the two videos. There is a model of her displayed in the Central Navy Museum in St. Petersburg. She's laid down in October 1935, the 22nd of October 1925, important date. Launched on the 30th of November 1936 and commissioned 23rd of September 1938. She's a training ship from 1961 onwards, August 1961. And she's finally stricken 
in December 1974, though she'd been technically sold for scrap already in February 1974. So, hmm? and she did receive the Order of the Red Banner. She received the Order of the Red Banner for her services. She took part in the Winter War. She took part in World War II. Um, she exchanged her 45 millimeter guns for fully automatic 37 millimeter guns uh, during World War II. She even got a Lend-Lease uh, quadruple Vickers uh, 50 cal machine gun. I'm not sure why the British were quite so cruel. Um, by 1944, she also has a Type 291, a Type 284, two Type 285, and two Type 282 radars supplied by the British. And I think she gets Aztec. She was overhauled between 1949 to 1953. All of her radars were replaced with Soviet systems. Um, the Rift Surf Search, Gears, Air Search Radars, Alps Surface Radar Gunnery, Yakko anti-aircraft gunnery radars, anti-submarine torpedoes, well, all anti-submarine tor weapons, torpedo launchers, aircraft equipment, boat cranes removed. The thing was, they did a full model and, re and a full conversion of her, an upgrade of her, primarily because they decided that this all cost half of a new Project 68 BIS Sverdov class. So it was it would provide her to serve two more decades, so it was it was successful. Mm, I'm not sure about a ship which has a range of 3,750 nautical miles at 18 knots being quite that successful for Russia. I do find it fitting that interesting they were originally fitted with the Arctur hydrophone. She have, did take part in many operations in World War II and in the Winter War. That is what sort of gave her successful status in the eyes of the Soviet public. She led the evacuation of Tallinn in August 1941. She was blockaded in Leningrad and she provided fire support during the siege of Leningrad. A 7.1 inch guns are not something which you want to really be dealing with. You want to try and take it out. She's attacked a lot while in port. Um, German air and artillery attacks regularly go, uh, go after her. She survives. She survives, and that's the important thing. Now, her sister Voshilov, well, she's built in Marty South. Nikolov. That's a very different yard. She's the only one which is a fellow Project 26, because the first two are Project 26, the second two are Project 26 uh, BIS, and the final two are Project 26 Bis 2. Now, she also receives the Order of the Red Banner. She's refit between April 1954 and December 1961. So she spends seven years being refitted. Post World War Two, she bombarded German troops during the siege of Odessa. She was damaged in 1941 by German bombers. She was returned from repairs in March 1942. She took part in supporting the siege of Sevastopol, the Kirk Federation uh, operation, the previous landings in Novorosk in end of January 1943. And basically, she stops getting involved in op 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 in operations when Joseph Stalin has his Hitler moment. Okay, in October nineteen forty three, three destroyers were lost to air attack. So Stalin forbids using large ships without his permission. The reason she's done the conversion for so long is because she's been converted to a missile test ship. So she is laid down in 15th of October 1935, then laid down before her sister. Launched June 1937, 28th. Commissioned the 20th of June 1940, 
out of service October 1972. Mm. You'll enjoy this because you'll get to see a part of her at the end. Her propeller survives. She had a very interesting career. Mm. Now in, for example, in June 1941, she covered Soviet destroyers bombarding Constantina after a German attack to the Soviet Union and was d damaged by a mine which was actually exploded by the paravines of Subravitsanings uh, and the destroyers' paravines. She bombarded Odessa on 19 September with 148 180 million shells and then is transferred to Novorosk shortly afterwards. Wow. Russians bombarding Odessa. In November that year, she was bombed in harbour by JU-88 of the Camp Shavada 51. She's hit twice. One hit for the start of the fire in number three magazine. It was extinguished by water flooding in from the second hit, which saved the ship, because if a number three magazine had ended up going up, there would probably be no more ship. These ships are, as has been pointed out, not exactly the most heavily armoured vessels in the world. They're really not. Really, really not. But as mentioned earlier, she is built in the Black Sea shipyard. Now, it's on the tip, southern tip of the Michelovian Peninsula. Um, it's, I think, currently part of Ukraine, the land where this is. It's, I don't think it's occupied at the moment. So, yeah, it's Ukraine. Um, uh, memory. Mm. And it's a critical yard. It's a critical building facility, and it was especially critical in this period. This is actually a picture from 1900. The facilities there were critical for Soviet production and Soviet construction of ships. They had the original slipway, which was 330 meters long and 40 meters wide, with two cone cranes, crane, gantry cranes, each cable lifting between 900 and 800 tons. Slipway number one, which was 400 meters long, 18 meters wide, and had a horizontal launch, a launching effect with help of the floating of a floating dock. The floating dock itself was 120 meters long, 41.5 meters wide, and capable of lifting up to seven and a half thousand tons. You see a small limit which might be affecting number one, uh, way number one in the scenario, and three keys, each 860 meters in length and portable cranes with capacity of 25 to 40 tons. This is by roughly 1956, but there's not much difference on its predecessor in 1930s, 1940s, when they're building these ships. It was important for these things to be built there, because, to quote Vashayev Molotov, our mighty Soviet power must have such a sea and ocean fleet that would comply with interests and be worthy of our great mission. In other words, they'd realized that they were literally up a creek without a paddle if they didn't have a ship. And enough of them. So they needed to build them. A lot. It was uh, renamed in honor of Andre Mate. Uh, the leading figure in the French Communist Party for nearly 30 years. What can I say? The Soviet Union liked to claim they were expanding. <sighs> Maxime Gorky. Maxime Gorky is, well, a happy name for a ship, for starters. Come on, it sounds happy, Maxime Gorky. I know the reality, but it does sound happy. Laid down December 1936, the 20th, 
uh, launched April 1938, commissioned December 1940, recommissioned, decommissioned, I mean, uh, February 1956. Also received the Order of the Red Banner. Seems to be going a lot of those going around. It's a slightly improved version, and when I say slightly improved version, I had a look and went, well, what have they improved? Well, its displacement is now 8,177 tons in standard, but it's now able to do 9,728 tons fully loaded. It's theoretically capable of 36.72 knots on trials. So I'm presuming when they're fully loaded, nowhere near. It can now do 4,220 nautical miles at 18 knots, so that's a lot more fuel. Wartime modifications included 15 fully automatic 37mm guns and two quadruple Lendley's Vickers 50 cal machine gun mounts. Um, she was again received radar from the British, the same sort of fit of a Type 291, Type 284, two Type 285s, and two Type 282s. But she could carry 96 to 150 miles. She could carry 50 depth charges. And she has a waterline belt, which is now 70 millimeters. And turrets and barbettes of 70 millimeters. That's, that's joyous. That's a whole increase of 20 millimeters. We're ecstatic. Ecstatic. She and her escorts um, ran into a German laid Apulda minefield in the Gulf of Riga while providing. D actually, d this is the interesting thing. They run into a minefield while defending Soviet operations at laying a minefield. Both Gorky and the destroyer Gvenny uh, lost their bows, although Gorky made it to port where temporary repairs were made. She's then transferred to Tallinn and later to Kronstadt. She has a new bow section fabricated at Kronstadt and made it to the ship in July 1941. For most of the rest of the war, she's blockaded in Leningrad and Kronstadt by Axis minefields. Could only provide ground fire, gunfire support to the defenders. Um, she fired 285 shells on the 4th of September 1941 and 700... Krasnaya Sepla Rosla offensive in January 1944. Her actual citation for her red banner reads For exemplary fulfillment of combat missions and courage and valor demonstrated by her crew. She also bombarded the Finnish positions as part of the 4th Artillery Group during the Soviet Vyberg Petrovask offensive in June and fired 180mm shells off Kuakola in a night for June. It's only, well, her most extended refit during the war occurs in the winter of 1942-43 to when her upper deck is reinforced with 37mm armour plates. Mm, I wonder why after surviving air attacks so lightly. This is Molotov, which is another Project 26 this. She is built again in the Marty South, same yard as her sister. She's renamed Slava or Glory in 3rd of August 1957. Mm, there are reasons. Having been laid down January 1937, launched December 1939, and commissioned the 14th of January 1941. She's an interesting vessel, same as her sister. But her career, well... Molotov remained in Sevastopol for the initial period of Operation Barbarossa to provide air warning. The advance of German troops into Crimea in late October 1941 forced her to transfer to Tuavas, where she continued to provide air warning. 
She was the first Soviet ship to carry radar, a Red Cup K air warning system, which she would use for the entirety of the war. And she used Soviet-designed Mars-1 gunnery radar systems from 1944 onwards. They also would test out the ship launching a supermarine Spitfire, but we'll leave that to one side. This is after her catapult, original one, was removed to make way for more light AA guns. They then take them off, fit another one to try and see if she can launch a supermarine Spitfire. I suppose you have them. Whilst providing air warning, she did bombard German troops near Fedosia with nearly 200 mm shells in November, Borun to pass, and she helped to carry the 386th Rifle Division from Poti to Sevastopol between 24th and 20th December 1941. During this operation, her stern was damaged by German artillery and she shelled Axis positions in retaliation. Firing 205 180mm rounds and 107 100mm rounds. Ship evacuated 600 wounded upon her departure on the 3rd of December. She carried out her transport role again in January. And her bow was damaged in a heavy storm to us when she was thrown against the jetty in late January 1942. Therefore, she spent most of her re under repair, although her bow could not be straightened. It almost seems to be better if you lose your bow. It's far easier to fix a lost bow than a bent bow. And bent bows will have an effect on your operating speed. They will have an effect on how clean you go through the or the water, because they can have an effect on the flow of the water especially. And as such, she makes bombardment sorties to help Soviet troops in what, but from March she returns to Potty for more permanent repairs. Which basically permanent is we cut off and we reattach. On 12th of June, Molotov transported 2,998 men of the 138th Rifle Brigade to Sevastopol. Shelling the German positions while unloading, she then elected, uh, she then evacuated over a thousand wounded, three hundred fifty women and children as she departed. She returned again in June, carrying three thousand eight hundred fifty-five re reinforcements in company with her ships, and evacuated two thousand nine hundred eight wounded and refugees. On aug in uh, late in August. While returning from another bomber motion mission near Fedosia, her stern was blown off by a Hunkel HE Trouble One. Um, some torpedo bomb bombers acting in concert with some Italian mass torpedo boats. The damage reduced her speed to 10 knots. She had to be steered by her engines, rather like Nubian when she was damaged off Crete. She was under repair until July 1943 and used the stern of the incomplete Shapiev class cruiser Frunz. The rudder and ink of the incomplete cruiser Zalonskov Zalonskov and the steering cruiser from uh, steering gear from the cruiser Kagnovich and the steering sensor from the submarine L25. However, even with all this effort to repair and get it ready. Stalin's order not to go to sea without his permission comes in October 1943 and Molotov doesn't get involved in any more. Kaganovich. Well, she has like a few names. Kaganovich is named for Lazar Kaganovich. She's at Project 26 BIS 2 Kirov. Now, what are the differences here? 70 millimeter belt. Same as the previous. Deck, 50mm. Okay. Turrets, 70mm. Alright. Barbette, 70mm. Alright. Conning Tower, 150mm. All sounds the same. 84,400 tons standard displacement. 
Well, that's gone up. 10,040 tons fully loaded. Okay. 5,590 nautical miles at 17 knots. Alrighty then. So. Where are these built for? Oh, they're built on the Amur River. Oh, they're built in the Far East. Larger, more powerful anti-aircraft armament, and especially more powerful anti-aircraft armament. Six forty-five millimeters, ten thirty-seven millimeters, all sorts of other things fitted. Eight eighty-five millimeter dual-purpose guns in single mounts, rather than hundred millimeter ones. Oh, sorry. <sighs> Turrets were small, cramped. Basically, you have to remember the ship that they are designed for, the base of the design is designed to be a very small light cruiser. And they have managed to come up with a treble of a turret which fits, but doesn't really fit that well. In fact, the guns are mounted in a single cr a cradle to minimize space. And so close together that their shot dispersion was high because of the muzzle blast from the, infest, uh, uh, the adjacent barrels affecting each gun. That's an issue for these uh, vessels. Now. She was laid out in 1938, launched from Dry Dock in 1944, and officially accepted into the Pacific Fleet on the 7th, 19, uh, 6th of September 1944, after being towed from the, uh, down the Amo River to Vladivostok. She was still incomplete at this date because this shipyard, as wonderful as it is, didn't have all the facilities. Things hadn't been delivered from the Western factories. For example, her propellers had to be shipped from Leningrad. But it had been surrounded by the Germans in September 1941. Her shafts had to be removed from the Barikni factory in Stalingrad before it was destroyed in 1942. And the ship actually itself had its own dock collapsed in on it in December 1942 as well. She was renamed Lazar Kagnovich to disassociate assault her from Kagnovich's disgraced brother Mikhail in 1945. She remained inactive. She couldn't do anything during the invasion of Manchuria in 1945. Spent her post war Trump here on training missions. She's renamed Petroplavsk after Kagnovich himself is purged from the government after running successful coup against Nikita Khrushchev. Never do an unsuccessful coup against Khrushchev. He will successfully eradicate you. There is a dispute over what happened to her. She might have been converted into a floating barracks and later sold for scrap. But there is also the option that she was simply solved scrap in 1960. I'd say she'd been through enough name changes and had enough bad luck going on thanks to that that she's probably gone. Now, this particular yard, OJSC Amo Shipbuilding Plant, sometimes called the Leninsky Console, uh, Console Shipyard, is pretty much the most critical shipyard to the Russians in the Far East. It was found in 1932. Employs 15,000 people, produces everything up to and including nuclear submarines, has built 97 submarines in total, 56 nuclear powered, 41 conventional, as well as 36 warships. Their construction includes Delta class battle uh, ballistic missile submarines, Echo class cruise missile submarines, Akula class attack submarines. And in 1992, Boris Yeltsin announced the um, 
this yard would no longer produce nuclear submarines, that they would only have one nuclear submarine construction site. However, however, the odds are this particular plant will get back into that as well again, because you always need multiple facilities. You always need multiple facilities. Ah, the cannon. Now, this is, of course, the last of this class to be discussed. So we're almost at the end of part one. Now, finding an actual picture of this vessel is pretty darn difficult. She was assembled and the newly constructed shipyard number 199 Komolsk on Amar, yard number 7, from components built at 189, shipyard number 189, that's the one in Leningrad. Her complete construction was prolonged by late directories from the factories in European Russia and the poorly built dry dock. Like her sister, the propellers had to be shipped from Leningrad and it had been surrounded. So she didn't join the Pacific Fleet till the 31st of December after completing her sea trials. At 19... I think she joined it in 1942-ish. But really isn't commissioned until 1953. And it was actually undergoing repair when the Soviets invaded Manchuria in 1945. She was declared the best ship in the Pacific for her training performance during 1946, winning four prizes, and became part of Fifth Fleet in January 1947. And 1953, when the where between January 1947 and May 1953, when the Pacific Fleet was temporarily split. She actually went to sea in 1951 for gunnery testing under the flag of the 5th Fleet Commander Yuri Pantelov, with the Commander-in-Chief of the Forces Far East, Marshal Rodion Malitsky, and Pramorsky Military District Commander General Sergei Bozov observing the firing. Also hosted, not just Malitsky, but Khrushchev, McCann, Bulgarin, and Kuznetsov during their visit to the Pacific Fleet in October 1954, demonstrating her main guns while they were aboard. She was a status vessel, and very good for that. And you have to remember, this is part of the reason for the construction of ships. Why were the Soviet Union building cruisers? Was it because they love peace and they wanted peace to break out around the world or was it because they were trying to shore up their position and export themselves around the world was it sure they were trying to show their power it's the power the fact that these ships despite having such well I would argue a shortened war, thanks to Stalin's decision, that isn't really held against them. They are still treated with great respect. The propeller, preserved. Something to go and see. And they were useful ships. Callan is fitted with um, Asdick from the British. She's equipped with British and American and least radar systems, as well as Soviet systems. So she has a Type 291 uh, alongside an American SG radar, both used for air search. A pair of Soviet Jupiter-1 radars used for main fire battery fire control. Anti-aircraft fire control was two British Type 282 radars. While she was supposed to be fitted with a ZK-2B catapult on the center line between the funnels, she was actually completed without catapult because it can be shipped from Leningrad in time. And so she had uh, six more guns fitted. 
Until, of course, they decided that actually they did have the catapult, and then they removed the guns and fizzled them. Why build cruisers? Let's be honest. If you're looking at the Black Sea and the Baltic, you have the same problem as the Mediterranean, where destroyers and lighter end cruisers that are basically supersized destroyers make sense because you can build them in numbers relatively cheap. They have relatively small crews and they're very high speed. All those things are useful. Battleships make sense. Cruisers necessarily don't. However, the Soviet Union has a problem. They are trying to achieve not just a rebirth of their navy, but a rebirth of their status. And you don't have status if you don't have cruisers, because as I said, always tell you, if you don't show up, you don't have a voice. If you don't have a voice, you don't matter. The people at the table who get the vote are the people who show up to vote. The people at the table who get uh, nations who get a vote at the table are nations who send and uh, hardware and have skin in the game. That's the case with all of this. And that's what the, uh, the Kirov class are about. They're about getting skin back in the game. So naval history. What have we got coming up? Well, we've got the Kirov class this week. You have got this video today. We've got part two on Friday. When hopefully I'll have had some sleep and various other things. So I will actually be getting through the night. It's been very, very hot. I'll hopefully finish the painting and you'll see some books behind me. Thank you very much, Cheryl. I hope you've enjoyed. I hope you found it interesting. And hope you enjoyed this part one, because as I said, there's going to be part two. And these are the lives this week. There's 21st of July, Patreon 58. Robert Locke, Ruse de Guerre or Deception, Disguise and Decoys in Naval Warfare. And Wayne Boring, the Infrastructure in the Colonies, Shipyards of the Commonwealth and Empire. That's going to be fun. Right. Take care, everyone. Hope you enjoy, and um, have fun.